indeed, if Professor Mato can join us, because as you have understood, this conference is meant to be a forum for debate, for discussion, for questions and answers. And I'm glad we have about 20 minutes to have our first round of questions. And uh, we will have, I guess, some microphones in this hall. And if there is anybody who would like to ask a question, please raise your hand, introduce you very briefly, wait till the mic arrives, and try to be as concise and focused as possible. So please, go ahead. There's one channel in this first row. And actually, I would even suggest that we'll collect two or three questions, then it makes help us. So next, uh, in the, okay, please. Well, thank you very much for the very inspiring speeches. Uh, my first question goes, uh, so my name is Guntram Wolf. I'm the director of Bruegel in Brussels. Um, and my first question goes to uh, Brigitte on the grand deal that you described. Perhaps you can enlarge a little bit on how this deal would look like in, in, in your views. Um, and my second question is to Professor Mato, um, which is on... Um, since you're a constitutional lawyer, uh, on the question of the Eurozone finance minister, which uh, is widely discussed. And in particular, I would like to hear from you um, how you would evaluate the idea of uh, putting uh, the Eurozone finance minister as a part of the European Commission. So as President Juncker has proposed, uh, this person to be the vice president. Now, I personally have a lot of doubts about it, um, also because um, of what you evoked, uh, which is um, the very clear institutional separation between the Commission as the initi initiator of legislation, but also as the institution that of course, gives recommendations uh, based on the EU treaties. And then the Council and the Parliament as legislators, as well as decision makers, for example, in the Stability and Growth Pact. And I think mixing the two in one function uh, could lead to quite a bit of institutional um, uh, ambiguity, which, uh, which I think will not be helpful. And I would like to hear the view of um, uh, such an eminent constitutional lawyer on this. Thank you very much. Thank you. I might collect at least one question more, so I can see. Okay. Even two, then. Even, yeah. Thank you. I have a question to Take the Mr. Amato um, about the uh, Future of Europe Convention. You played a very important role during 2003 and 4. And uh, as we know, uh, this constitution or constitutional treaty failed in the homeland of the president of the convent. Uh, what went wrong, according to your understanding? Why this constitution failed and where, why there was no voting in the convention? This was a decisions have been made in a very small group of uh, so-called wise men, as I know. Thank you. This was Mr. Ivar Reich from Tallinn University. And now, last, from so, microphone here, here please. <coughs> Mario. Uh, I am uh, Mario Lauristin, a member of the European Parliament. And I thank you both very much for a very interesting introduction. But my question is, uh, looking now at this uh, rebuilding, refashioning, or any kind of changes. Uh, what is your view? How European Council could be refashioned? Because looking from Parliament side, I have said that we have made a lot of progress, because Parliament really have found its role, I suppose, more appropriately. Uh, but what we see that the Council is still working like it was. Uh, there is problem of transparency, there is problem of the, the real debate uh, concerning negotiation between different uh, legitimate interests of different countries, and there are also the problem of the rhythm of the work, because uh, very often we are waiting for council decision because council is working very, very, very slowly because of this organization thing. You know that there are ideas to have something like Senate. Uh, working permanently, having permanent dialogue with the parliament. So what's your opinion about the council's role? Thank, this thank you. This is not refashioning. This is 
so maybe we could st uh, start answering. Maybe Bridget, would you like to start? Well, firstly, on, on the grand bargain, I would say far too early to say just how grand the grand bargain will be. And in other words, will it be within the existing treaty framework or requiring beyond? Uh, and I think given that it's unlikely that a coalition agreement in Germany is, uh, won't emerge for another couple of months, we're going to have to wait and see. But if one looked at where, where, the, where the zone is, the landing zone of, of agreement might be, I would have thought defence and security uh, is one area where you will already a lot of movement with the European Defence Fund and uh, structured cooperation and how much further that might go, would go, um, is, is, is out there. I think one question I have is what would the geographical reach of that be? In other words, who would be involved? Uh, but there's no doubt that uh, on borders, fr Frontex isn't enough. Uh, on uh, the NATO, the defence side of the European side of NATO uh, need for action and then finally on internal security because the internal security challenge is not just complex and difficult now but it will get worse and is getting worse as you get a lot of returnees of I ISIS um, fighters from, uh, from Syria and, and, and Iraq. So that's one area and then how much on EMU? Uh, I think you get noises about some some move on the budgetary side. Uh, I would have thought that if something, if banking union could be completed, that in a way would be perhaps the most important. But that again involves the whole debate about risk and risk sharing. Difficult without. No. Uh, and difficult. Now, can I just very briefly move on to the um, to the question on the council? Uh, nation state to member state. Member states matter. Governments matter. The council is an absolutely essential part of the European Union. And I, for one, have always thought that the European Council is an extremely important arena for the legitimacy of what happens in the EU. Why? Because in the European Council, you have the most authoritative political actors of their member states. They're the ones who tend to lead their parties, tend to have won elections, etc., etc. So I, for one, do not envisage uh, or would not favour a very dramatic shift in the balance between the Parliament and the Council. I think the Parliament has gained very significant legislative powers. Uh, the area where perhaps, and this is in terms of the Parliament itself and its development, uh, if you had a European tax capacity, however small, uh, then that would strengthen the Parliament, in my view, because the uh, the old adage of uh, no no taxation without representation. Actually, in the EU, the problem is representation is problematic without taxation. In other words, the Parliament is not a complete Parliament in that it doesn't have a revenue raising capacity. But. I, uh, on, on the Senate, I think I'd, I wouldn't rebalance dramatically the relationship between the European Council and the Parliament. Yeah. Over to you, Chilema. Yeah, I would agree with you, Bridget, on, on this point, because it's not enough for the European Council to be the second chamber of a, a bi um, by uh, cameral uh, uh, legislative system. It is for the Council of Ministers yes. to be that kind of body, and we had envisaged at the time a legislative council as the only format for the council to legislate while the re resiliency of the sectoral ministers uh, led eventually to the decision to leave to the sectoral formats the legislative power which makes things much more confused for people. 
The European Council, as Brigitte has rightly said, is essential to give legitimacy from the angle of the member states to the decisions that are taken at the European level, but what the system resents is that nowadays it's not the European interest that comes first anymore. It is the European Council that decides, begins the process, and what the Commission does follows. Even regulations and directives are now prepared by a commission which has the monopoly following the decision of the European Council that has already decided the contents of these regulations and directives. So the six packs uh, came out and also the two packs, which is a, a little bit subversive. I'd like the European interest to remain first, but to be not authorized to reach the Parliament and the Council of Ministers without being somehow accepted by the European Council, which should come second and not first. This is the point. Going to the European Finance Minister, you are right. Uh, uh, here there is a clear mistake. Uh, uh, the president of the High Representative, which is completely different, because in that case we had the problem of putting together the competencies of the Commission in external relations and the competencies of, of the Council in foreign policy. So it's quite bizarre for a single organization to have two sets of foreign relations, one uh, in the Commission and one in the Council. But this is our life, uh, and this is much worse than the hermaphrodite, because it's a two-headed kind <laughs> of creature, because my poor fellow citizens, Federica Mogherini, who is a nice woman, has to wear the double hat, which implied double head. Uh, I mean, monster, monster, monster. So there is no reason to have a second monster here. And I th my preference goes to a member of the commission having this function and also having the future European mo Monetary Fund, the EMS, transformed under its competence. This is an essential part, uh, uh, Brigitte. I, I, in my view, it, it, it will prove impossible to complete the banking union if we don't disentangle our bank's portfolio and the uh, national sovereigns, because this is the problem nowadays. And in order to disentangle national banks and public bonds of their state, we have to take care of this area of bonds. The European Constitution, and I finish, failed for the simple reason that it was not a constitution. Uh, it was too much for somebody, not enough for others, and most of all, in, at least this was my personal reaction to the fact that in the Convention we had two jobs. Writing a constitution it was a sort of decision of the convention, anyhow, and consolidating the existing treaties, which was the only job we had received for, from the Lacan. Uh, but anyhow, consolidating the existing treaties meant writing 300 articles, which were fewer than the articles of all of the treaties that were consolidated, but had nothing to do with the hundred and something articles of the Constitution that as such was shorter than the Italian, the French, and the German Constitution. But the governments, in order to have one only document to ratify, wanted stubbornly to have these two 
products merged in a single document, the Constitution for Europe and the Consolidated Treaty. And another monster came out, a document, 400 articles, thick like this, and it was impossible to read it. And any opposer could say, this is a constitution, you can read it. This is the European constitution, you can't even read it. I was absolutely sure of it. I and that had said it, but the governments not always understand. They only understand what is convenient for them. And it's a job. It was voted upon by the plenary. No, don't think that it was a, 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 a group of wise men. The group of wise men, the presidium, uh, 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 made the proposal, but it was not the presidium of the Soviet Union. It was the presidium of the European Convention. Please, there was a democratic vote on it. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, I think we have time for a second short round of questions. So if there is any, yeah, I see. On the very back there, and then here yeah, first. Okay, okay. Let's let's start from the first row then. Yeah. Thank you, Martin Sandby from the Financial Times. Uh, Tuliano Amato talked about uh, democratic deficits and how there are two ways of looking at them. Uh, on the input side, can I choose somebody else to represent me? And on the output side, are things working out for me? Or input legitimacy and output legitimacy, some would call it. So I have a brief question about each, and I'd like both of you to to address them. On the input side, there was another idea in Emmanuel Macron's speech, which follows things he said during the campaign, a proposal for popular consultations in any member state that might be interested. Uh, but my understanding is it would be some coordinated process. So I'd like to hear your views on that idea. On the output side, uh, surely it's right that we would like the EU better if it worked better for us. And indeed, we see as the economy has been recovering, support for the EU, support for the euro, and so on, go up. But uh, I wonder if we're asking enough why the current institutions aren't doing, delivering what they're supposed delivering. to. Uh, and if we don't know the answer to that, how do we know that new institutions will actually remedy things? If the problem is instead a lack of political will or... The, the wrong political incentives or transparency or lack thereof that shape those incentives, all of those things on Macron's list that Bridget put up were basically institutional initiatives. Um, but shouldn't we be thinking a bit more about why the current institutions aren't delivering and what is the answer to that? Thank you. And then another from the last row. Yeah. Thank you, both of you, for your insightful analysis and comments. I'm Jörg Erik a liaison officer of the uh, Estonian Presidency of the Council and also a master's degree from Catholic Universiteit Leuven from Belgium. So my comment is actually about the Council, coming back a little bit to uh, MEP Lauristin's question, but more in the direction of intergovernmentalism. So with the digital summit here, there's an increased appetite, if you might, for European leaders, heads of state, to come together more often and with the fact that uh, President Tusk has also seemingly taken control of uh, devising conclusions, a roadmap for future European integration, could we perhaps talk of a renewed impetus for intergovernmentalism as actually the driving force for further European integration, which would in a sense actually be uh, sort of unheard of? Thank you. Thank you. And yeah, that's all we can take right now. I guess you can ask eventually questions during the coffee break directly, but please, Bridget. So, Martin, the question on input and output legitimacy, well, I, I will complicate it by saying input, output. There are those who argue about throughput, in other words, transparency and that. I don't give much. They have invented the third way. Eh? <laughs> but, no, no, I do think there's something... We poor people had remained to the input and the output. <laughs> In the meantime, they invented the throughput. I think there is something called systemic legitimacy, and that is how we feel about the political systems we're part of. In other words, are we broadly comfortable with being part of this, and it's not directed just at what, you, what the input side is, or the output, or even the throughput. In other words, it is the level of effective attachment to a political mm. system. And here, I think, 
on the EU, there is a very, there are, there's a lot of variation across Europe. And one of the underlying explanations for Brexit, for example, is that in the United Kingdom, there really was very weak sense that the EU was a good thing, that I identified with the EU on if an average of 60% of Europeans now are comfortable with being European and national, in the United Kingdom, it was 38 being comfortable with being European and national. So I think don't, don't underestimate the importance of what I would sum up as being comfortable with. So on the input side, uh, I think the, the, the Macron's uh, popular consultations, if properly run, I think we know from experiments with citizens' assemblies that they are quite effective exercises in engaging with people about complex issues. And in despair, in, during the Irish crisis, I was part of a group where we decided we would get funding to run a small citizens' initiative in order to prove to the government that they might do this. And I was engaged in this process where we went from right across to six or seven venues across Ireland. People coming out, sitting around round tables, talking about taxation and things. I left that experiment convinced of the value. It was quite extraordinary because it, what happened was they would hear from experts, so-called knowledgeable people about the problem. And then people would sit down round a table with a mediator and have to come up with what their sense at the end of an, an hour-long discussion was. And it was quite transformative. People liked it. They liked being engaged, but also you ended up with people very willingly changing their minds. And it was dialogue. So I think input really matters. The question is how you can organize input in a very efficient and very, uh, in an effective way, given the scale we're dealing with. But I certainly think more on input uh, is, is, is necessary. And then on output, why the current institutions are not working so well. I mean, th th there's a very long, uh, very long and complex answer to that. But I would say that if you look at the challenge of governance across the world, not just in the EU, it's very easy to identify the demand side for governance. And we did. I mean, we can all come up with the list here. The problem today, I think, is the struggle with the supply how you can match the demand for governance beyond the level of the state with the capacity to deliver it, given the dominance of domestic politics that, that, that I spoke about. So yes, institutions really matter, and they really matter in the EU, as does the constitutional and legal framework. Um, but it, it's also, in my view, there is a politics trap in the EU that's deeply structural uh, and problematic. Mm -hmm. And then on the intergovernmental, the EU, if you think back to the 1980s, to the Single European Act, which was transformative of the EU, that came out of two dynamics, a dynamic within the European Commission on the single market and a dynamic the governmental level, and in my view, the EU needs both. It can't be driven just by the member states. The Commission, the European institutions must also be involved. So I, I think that intergovernmentalism and uh, inter, the intergovernmental dimension of the EU is extremely important, but so too is the supranational, and it needs both. Yeah. It needs both. Uh, uh, the point is that no decision at the European level can be taken without involving the member states. The real difference, what makes a difference is when the decision one way or another is within the competence of the European level and once adopted it legal effects are immediately produced. Another thing is when the decision is adopted at the European level, but due to the fact that there is no competence there to adopt legal acts, 
facts producing that effect, you need member states one by one to adopt acts consistent with that decision. This is the intergovernmental method that uh, appears quite ineffective in areas where the production of effects uh, has to be immediate, where adaptation to national conditions uh, is not needed. So this is the difference you have to care of. But eliminating the intergovernmental feature of a European decision-making process would be a nonsense and a mistake. Having said so, well, I mean, uh, I don't think of current institutions. Eh? I think of uh, if you adopt, if you reach an agreement for a better efficiency of the Eurozone in which national levels are doing something and the European level is used for the stabilization function, you adopt the institutional reform that is needed to implement this substantive decision you have adopted. So we were discussing previously of the best for the European finance minister. If we get convinced that there are decisions that need a European finance minister, we have to introduce the European finance minister. The difference I was underlining before was between uh, a, a, a European, uh, let's say, conference, inter intergovernmental conference, that has to decide about do we want a one-speed, a two-speed, or a four-speed Europe? Do we want to elect the president of the commission or the president of the council or the same figure, etc., etc.? <laughs> I would say, please don't do it. People uh, don't feel this need. This basic output, let me elect the president of Europe, uh, this basic input is not so important. Important are other things, but these other things might require themselves some uh, 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 institutional changes that are, however, directly connected with substantive reforms that are agreed upon among the member states to improve their delivery at the European level. Okay? Thank you. Actually, Sorry for you, but Brexit is Brexit, and therefore... So we have uh, exactly 26 minutes left for a coffee break. But before, please join me in thanking our first speakers, uh, Bridget Lafana, Julian Amato. So, but the coffee has served just around the corner, and please be back exactly at 5 p.m. You don't want to miss this brilliant next panel session. Thank you.